Um, so I'm Shanti. Welcome to everyone. Uh, we're just talking. It was a, it was actually something that came up a few weeks ago around the sourcing of the Moralees, and um, we had chit chatted about it outside of the recording. So I thought, let me just add this into the recording now. Um, how the history of the Moralees has worked out is that. As you all know, Brahma Beba was sort of soul searching in the 1930s. And in recent weeks, we've had the Morali where Shiv Beba has told everyone to read Brahma Beba's diary that was back in 32. So we can see even in that diary, there was a lot of bhakti mixed into that. He's talking about what his gurus are teaching and so on. And Shiv Beba made the comment a few weeks ago that how Brahma Beba was like a Hindu priest, really, and he knew so much about, he could read Sanskrit and uh, some other holy languages too, and he knew a lot. So there's a journey that has to occur for Brahma Beba in his understanding. And what Shiv Baba was saying to us a few weeks ago is that he would speak the morally in the languages that Brahma would understand. Because his priority is to help Brahma Baba understand. Because Brahma Baba is the first soul. He is Adam. He is the seed. And if he doesn't understand, no one else can understand. This is a rule within the drama. He That soul begins back then. We're all doing back. You know, so when whatever that soul is doing, we're all following on from that. So this is why Shiv Baba has to ensure that he understands. And therefore, he's communicating the early Moralis in Sindhi. Brahma Baba spoke, Sindhi was his native tongue. And then the um, that area of Sindhi is quite close to Punjab and the holy areas of the Sikhs and the Sikh scriptures are written in languages like Gurumukhi and there's an old language called Bali. So Brahmavada also spoke bits and pieces. So the Buddhist texts, they're mainly in Pali, which is an older language of India. So Brahmavada could also get his way around those languages. Then Sanskrit is the most scholarly Hindu language. So he, he'd also learned that, and he could do that. Then Hindi is the main spoken language in India. And he based himself in, um, uh, he based himself in Calcutta, which at that time was the capital of British India. So there the native language is Bengali. And his children were brought up uh, in schools in Calcutta. So they are, in fact, also native speakers of Bengali, as well as Sindhi and English. So Brahma Baba actually was quite good with languages. And what you get is a mixture within the morally. And if you hear it in Hindi, you can identify the different things. And also Hindi was not Brahma Baba's first language. And you can tell that by the grammar. Like also, for me, Hindi is not a first language, so Hindi speakers listening to my Hindi would know that straight away because it's just not your native um, tongue, and you can feel that they speak Hindi different. So again, when you hear the Moralese in Hindi, you can tell that Brahma Baba, he, it's not his native tongue of speaking Hindi. He speaks it in a slightly different way. Um, so... There's that journey. Then you've got the audiences. So in from 1936 to 1950, they were in Sindh. They were in Hyderabad and Karachi. So Shimbaba spoke the morally in Sindhi. Then they shifted over to Mount Abu in 1950. And the audiences changed. They began centers. And mainly it was Hindi as the national language, the overall national languages would be Hindi and English. That's also very, that was also very controversial at that time as well, as uh, India became a new country. So, Shibbaba's moralities have been in Hindi mainly since the 1950s. 
And then the connection back um, to London again is that it was actually, so Sister Genti's family moved back to London in 1955 or something like that. It was something like that. So they, she, I think she was born in London and she was born in India and then they moved back to London and it was something like that. Um, and it was her mother who then became a very firm BK around about that time. But her father was pretty against, and he was part of that group. And they, they're they all part of Brahmavada's extended family. So Devi Janki was also a Kriplani. Sister Janki is a Kriplani. That's the surname of Brahmavada before, before he was Brahmavada. So his name was Lakiraj Kripalan. Um, so, you know, they the way that the Brahmin family has grown is it was like friends and relatives initially. So they tended to be Sindhi. And it grows like that. So then this family has come to London. And India was still quite backward then, I mean, it's, it remained quite backward in a lot of things, you would say, mainly until the 1990s, in fact. Um, so they certainly didn't have that many re recorders and video devices and things. These were not widely even available. So the audio recording device was sent by Brother Morley. His name was Morley, so not just the Morley, because uh, Morley in Hindi means flute, and it's... Um, often connected with Sri Krishna, and that he plays a flute. So it was Brother Morley who, uh, I think he would have been convinced by Sister Rajni, who Sister Rajni is um, Sister Genthi's mother, to purchase this and send it across. So they took it across when they visited Madhavan. I believe it was 1956, 57. So we've got recordings from them. And we're hearing some of Mama's classes. Well, we had an extract yesterday after the Morali. So this, initially there was one recorder and it would either be with Baba or go around with Mama. And then later on, they brought another one from the UK. And one followed Baba around and one followed Mama. So uh, before then, there was no audio recording. So you had four of the BKs taking shorthand notes. And then, I mean, they did their best. Um, but the transcripts were late 50s on them. So then it's like building up systems, because even if you've got an audio recording, you still got to transcribe it, you've then got to print it, you've then got to send it. So it's quite a big operation. Then, and then translations didn't happen until much later. Um, even the English, so the early students of the 1970s, they also didn't receive an full English copy of the Morley. They received uh, translated notes, and that was written read in the English class, I think up until the early 1980s, 81, something like that. And then the London Centre began systematically uh, translating the Morley's into English, and then from English it went into a other places and other brothers and sisters they translated into other languages so you know we've got a bit of a journey in terms of language in terms of recording and then also in terms of understanding so uh, Devi Chandramani uh, he uh, Devi Chandramani was one of the very first BKs. She, her family attended Baba's Morley classes in September 1936. And she used to share that she can recall that Baba had two early pictures that he himself had hand drawn. And the first one was the cycle. So it was like a swastika with a circle around it. 
And um, the second one was the three worlds. That that three worlds she remembers was heaven up above this world and hell down below. So it was still a bhakti understanding. And Shiv Baba took his time to get everyone up to speed. So it's in that very first Avyakt Maradi that we've read a few times in these chit chats, and we'll read it again next January when it comes on. Um, so 21st January 1969 is the first time Baba speaks a Maradi through Daddy Gozar's body. And only Shiv Baba comes. And he says that he didn't bring Brahma Baba with him. Because everyone was still, it was the funeral day and everyone was still very emotional. But Shibab is very powerful. Like he's very, he's, he, I don't think he does emotions anyway. But he just comes very clearly and pragmatically. And what he says in that morally is, you'll need to repeat the moralies. You know, Baba is given the foundation course. There's a lot in these moralies. And you probably couldn't even remember the Mardi from the morning. Uh, so you're going to need to repeat these Mardis. And he said, in particular, focus on the Mardis um, since Mama left. And she left in 1965. And he was saying by then, the knowledge had become very clear. So you're looking at a good 30-year journey there to get things clear. And then, of course, we've had the Aviak Tamaralis since 1969. And what that is said is that they are actually the revision course, so the foundation course, uh, the Moralis that we hear Monday to Saturday. And they are mainly from 1964-65 until 1969. So we have about five years of Moralis. And then they do include some of the Moralis before them, but they, in Madhuban, the team checks the content because Shri Baba has said they could be still, they were in the process of clarifying them at that time. So they're making sure that it's not something which later was clarified and was incorrect. So they will use a little bit of discernment there with those earlier moments. Um, but the ones that we hear, they're mainly the audio recordings. We got all of them, the audio recordings, actually since 63. So 63 up until 69. They're all available in Hindi. Um, and then we got Mama's classes as well. So those are transcribed uh, that we hear. Uh, what some of them are combined though so you'll notice we don't get a date in those mornings because it can be a mixture of sections from so they are from the audio recordings and they are the transcriptions but not necessarily of all in the same day and this is why sometimes you'll hear a morally and it feels like that has jumped <laughs> another subject, and it's because the way that it's been compiled um, sometimes doesn't flow as well. Um, and then it was after Baba became Aviak, so since the 1970s, the senior sister in Madhuban at that time, her name was Didi Manmahino, and she was the very first BK to surrender into Baba's Yagya. And um, Didi Manmaini, she decided that it would be useful to have a bit of a summary at the start and at the end of the Mali. Because now, now Indians are different, but previous generations of Indians, they didn't really ask questions. Yeah, and now it's a it's different. But um the old Asian way of learning was you basically listen to your guru in silence. And it's like a tra you're being transmitted knowledge into you. And like no one asks questions. You, you don't sit in a religious gathering with your hand. <laughs> no one asks any questions. And so the way in which those older 
in the UK, we have many students from Asia even now. So you can even find that now, but times have changed a bit. Um, but, and I'm talking about my locket work as a university professor. So if you're thinking back to the 1960s, 70s, those generations, they well, it was quite passive learning. So they will listen to the model, but mind is not necessarily engaging. The intellect is not necessarily churning. And many of you might know Brother Atam Prakash, who served for many years in the Toli department in Madhavan. And now I think mostly he's giving classes, touring different places. And he used to uh, double, he was older because you'll remember that it was him, Brother Surya, and Brother Ramna. These were the three brothers who could speak English back in the day. So they took all of the classes back in the day. Um, and I can remember once one brother or sister from some country asked Brother Atom Prakash that, what benefit have you gained from the double foreigners coming? to Madhavan. And he said churning, because he said Indians don't ask questions. And it was only when the double foreigners. And if you look at drama, the, how everything worked out with Devi Janaki coming to London, that was also very good drama, because she was a churner. So even now, um, like, most of you, you tune into my daily recordings, and I hope that I'm conveying to you the type of education we received uh, at the London Centre. I hope that that's coming across to you. Now, I think I was fortunate to be there at a time where you probably had the best education that you could get in the BK world, the days before the internet. Now, Happily, everything is available for everyone. But in those days, location really mattered. And if you were at the London Centre, you had three great teachers, Devi Janki, Didi Subesh, and Didi Janti, right? So, and then because Devi Janki was there, so many others were traveling through London. So we must have met nearly every Devi, every Didi, every brother. So we had lots of chances. And we had a rich education. But Devi Janki is quite unusual. So if you read Devi Janki's classes compared to others, you know, they won't, like even if you, when we hear Mama's classes, Mama is sort of reinforcing the main points because just for people to understand, never mind Chun, it was like, well, it was way away. But Daddy Jenki was really the first one that was the churner. And Didi Manmahini was encouraging all of this. So the essence and the question and answer at the top of the Marley and the essence for inculcation at the end of the Marley, she added these in, in the 1970s. So Didi Manmahini, she had... Um, and she was very yeah, nurturing and also very nurturing of your educational development. So she used to say, like if you're a mother bum and say you're there, a few of you are there, she might say, come, let's go and play badminton. So you're thinking, okay, we're going to play, you know, better get a racket. But she didn't mean that. So she would then sit you to one side and ask you questions from that day's work. And your response was you hitting the shuttlecock back. So she was really the first one to begin starting this into the Brahmin family. Otherwise, the culture was not that. The culture was that you receive knowledge. And everyone is, of course, looking up to that. And we're just sort of receiving. And then you ask everyone, you know, did you enjoy the money? And everyone just says yes. And then they're gone. 
But what Didi was trying to encourage was the engagement of the intellect into that knowledge. So that's why we have an essence or a heading at the start of the moment. And then she was encouraging everyone to create questions and answers from the moment. So when uh, my mother, Renjin Ben, uh, took knowledge in 1982, her course teacher was Didi Sudesh. And I can recall, uh, many of you might remember carbon paper. Do you remember those? You used to put those sort of ink carbon papers to create copies so you could write on the top and it got copied on the page underneath. Our home was full of these because Didi Sudesh had asked Ranjan Ben. She saw that Ranjan Ben was also this type to engage her into it. So the one commonality that Ranjan Ben and I have is this love for the moral. I mean, that's sort of held our friendship together. Uh, and it's this one thing that both of us have a very deep interest in. So my childhood was just seeing piles of moralies everywhere and notebooks and Ranjan Ben creating questions from each morally with answers. And then I can recall that sometimes Didi would get her to go to different places and just sort of have this question and answer. That's right. Do you remember yeah. those places? So I think she benefited a lot from that. So that has then been from the 1970s. And then after the essence for Dharana, at the end of the Moli, you have a blessing. And those blessings, they began in 1993. And uh, Dada Raju is the brother who is the head of this Morley department in Madhubam. And how these blessings started was Bab Dada had come in 1993 for extra meeting, just to meet the brothers and sisters in Madhava. And he met each one personally. So each of them got a one-to-one -one with Bhakti there. Maybe like 100, I think it was on that occasion, 100 mainly brothers living there. And I think Baba might have met them in the history hall as well. So they had an intimate session and um, Rajabai had recorded each one. And then what he thought, he'll give the recording. And then he also typed up um, everything and then gave that to it. So once he had typed it up, he showed Daddy Prakash for me. So by then, Didi Manmaini, she's also become Karamati. She left her body in 1983. So the senior sister in Madhuban is Daddy and so Rajubai has shown her that oh, he's typed all this up and his plan is to give the blessing to each of the brothers and sisters in Madhuban. So they've got it and they can refer back to it. And Daddy's comment was, are you just going to benefit those hundred? And she, her thought was that the way Baba works he gives a blessing to one of us, but actually all of us can make that blessing our own. Because it, he could be speaking to one person and you are the one actually implementing. <laughs> so I, the blessing actually becomes more your own. And there's a story that Didi Shashi, who brings back the bold messages at Om Shanti Baba, she had... Um, lived with Didi Manmaini for many years in Madhukam. And Didi Manmaini came to Baba about four months earlier than Mama. And she was 11 years older than Mama also. But after two years, Mama had become the senior sister of the Yagya and everyone had begun to call her the mother. And then as we know, Mama became number one in everything. And 
Sister Shashi, she shares that Didi Mamani would share this story that once she had even asked about that, that I have done everything, like everything from the first day that you have said to do, I put attention to put everything into practice. But why is it still that Mama is ahead of me? She has done everything, I agree as well. She has done everything you said and put it into practice. But I have also done it and put it into practice. Why is she still there? And apparently Baba's answer was that it's true that you have done everything Baba has asked of you. But Mama also did everything that Baba asked of us. And this was the added uh, value that Mama gave, that she didn't think that because Baba is speaking to someone else, it's not for her. But she caught that anything falling in your ears, that's Baba talking to you. And so these first hundred blessings, they are actually those personal meeting blessings turned into a blessing. But... Um, they're now no longer belonging to any BKs, are they? They're for all BKs, and they've become part of the moral now. So this was Devi Prakashwani's like very broad thinking, that why should it just be benefiting 100 people? Let's benefit the whole family. And then after 100 days, of course, <laughs> Brother Raju's run out. So then what do we do? Because everyone likes these blessings at the end of the month. And so then Daddy said, well, all of Baba's words are blessings, aren't they? So the rest of the blessings, they're actually made from the Moralis from 1994, 1993, 94, until 1999. So those are, that's how the blessings. So... You can see that the Moralis in this is a bit of development along the years. And this is why I very much feel that when I record something or I speak any knowledge, I tend to stay within certain boundaries. And the boundaries are firstly the Moralis. I have heard or I've read every Marley a minimum of a hundred times, for sure. And so I know these Marleys very well. Then I will supplement that. We've got Mama's classes and Daddy Jenki's classes. And you see, when Mama became Karamathit in 1965, she was like, she was the class giver. So Baba spoke the morally, Mama gave classes. No one else gave classes. All the other daddies, they gave the course. But then to have a class just meant they read the morally to you. They didn't they would give classes themselves. There was no uh, culture of churning and giving classes and things. Um, but... Didi Manmuni knew that Daddy Janki was a churner. So Daddy Janki used to say that she was in Madhuban in 1966. And to her surprise, Didi Manmuni said, because uh, Didi used to call her Sister Janki. So she used to say, Janki, uh, at this time, you're now going to give class in the history hall, because a group has come from that. So the classes of Madhuban, they began with Eddie Janki giving classes. So she was appointed as the main class giver and the churner of the Yagya. And I can recall, even as a child in the 1980s, numerous times where, especially if it was a double foreigner, in those days, you could meet Baba personally. And they would ask Baba Dada a question numerous times. Baba Dada said, Janak, Baby Janki, she will give a class on this time. 
So even Badeve would sometimes not expand on the topic, and he would defer to Devi Jenki and allow Devi Jenki to expand on it for him. So I think we've got to understand the status that Devi Jenki's classes have as well here. And I most of her classes were not recorded, but I had an opportunity to hear so many. I must have heard oh, well over a thousand of her classes. She used to give classes sometimes three, four times a day. So you know, we got that. And then we've got, you know, certain, you know, like at the moment we've got people like Sister Mahini, she's giving classes, we've got Sister. So I tend to stick within certain parameters and then just focus everyone back on. Did you hear? Did did you catch this point from the morning today? So that's really my sentiment behind everything that uh, you heard the Mardi, but did you notice this? Uh, isn't this interesting? Uh, did you understand what Baba means by this? So that's what's flowing through my mind. And so I would recommend to everyone, Baba said to us this week as well, never miss a Mardi. Have a, have a Mardi every day because those Mardis are filled with so many layers, so many blessings. And then just really focus on understanding because I have spent years making sure I understand and reading and rereading more things. Then later on, you can churn more, right? Because once you've got more of a mastery, then the churning is also there. But that churning is bounded within the points of the mind. So I don't call it churning where someone shares something which then seems to contradict the Mali. I won't call that. I feel there has to be a certain bounding within that as well. So I hope that clarifies a little bit about this journey. And now you would say that together with Baba, the ocean of knowledge, we also have a Brahmin family that's an ocean of knowledge because it's not just Baba, but it's the Brahmins who have been using morally over a long period of time. They've got experience and then they've got different contexts. So, you know, where even something a Brahmin says and suddenly it maybe helps you to understand, oh, you know, I now get that from the morally. You know, this is how I should practice. This point. So there's that helpfulness, but all the time you want to have really understood the Mali directly yourself because then you're very far. Because all human beings are limited. And in BKs, we don't have a guru system. No, there's no BK who can have authority of knowledge. The authority of knowledge is only Shabbat. So that's how the mornings went. And Bika Ben, did you want to sort of ask anything else or did I sort of do the comprehensive coverage? I think it was quite comprehensive and I really appreciate this being recorded because I think it will help a lot of souls, you know, where the Mali is concerned. And I know a few who would be interested, who not on your chat, will want to hear this. So Thank you very much, brother, for this. Yes, and uh, let me add in one more thing. Then, what's the status of org messages, trans messages? So, Baba has taken that up in today's moment. And Baba seems to use a combination of education and sort of spiritualism, mysticism within his system. So one of the mystical parts of his system is there are some souls who have this gift of going into a trance state and meeting Baddede in the angelical, in the subtle region, and bring back messages. And that's been there right since 1936. So what Baba explains to us is that 
he does sometimes use those messages to give us some form of information. So some of them are quite visual. So we do get some insights. And in some moralities, he even refers to that. He says that some of you, you had those visions of the golden age and what how people will get married and what will happen in the golden age. Or he says that some of you saw how the religious fathers would all come and meet at, their, their, at this time of the confluence age, but they're in an ordinary form because they've also taken rebirth and come down their staircase and so on. So he does also refer that there are some insights that we can gain. He also tells us that as at different phases of confluence age, he uses them more. Like so in those days of Karachi, particularly when tensions were there around partition and they stayed in Karachi from partition from 47 right up into 50. So those three years could could have been quite tense. Um, and I'm not sure, I think they had to lock down quite a lot during that period. So Baba said he used visions a lot more at that time. And he says to us as well, he'll sustain us like that more as time goes on as well here. And we're in this phase at the moment where we're being sustained quite a lot through Borg messages, actually. Um, and the internet had provided us access mm, to some of them. But what Bebe explains is they don't have the status of a moral because there is a clear distinction between Shiv Baba coming into a body and speaking to us directly, rather than him giving a message through someone else to give to us. So I referred back to that first Abhyakt Morali, which is the 21st of January, 1969, when only Shiv Baba came, interviewed the body of Devi Gozan. And Devi Gozan went into a trance state, the soul, I think, was still inside of the body, but Baba switched off her consciousness. So when Baba was using Daddy Gozar's body, Daddy Gozar is not consciously awake and aware of anything Baba is doing, and she is not interfering in any way at all. Um, so Shem Baba said in that morally that these Bhug messages, they that have their own beauty, but they don't have the magic of the moral. And one of the memorials in Hinduism of Krishna's flute, or the flute is called the Morali, is that it was magic. And so there's something around Shubhada himself coming and speaking, which has a magic that the Bhul messages won't have. And these sisters, as much as they try, there's going to be some interpretation. There, they, you know, we all have memory. You know, level, you know, they might forget something Baba said. They might say it in a slightly what different way to the way he said it. That's inevitable, and therefore, we don't quote the Bhul messages with the same authority as we do with the, like we got the video recordings or we got the audio recordings, we got the transcriptions. So we quote that with the that authority. So Baba is emphasizing that in today's world, that, you know, trance actually has a lower status, even to yoga. It definitely has a lower status to the moral. So he's encouraging everyone because it seems like it's so amazing, doesn't it? Like, why would we not be impressed if someone can go into trance? But that is downplay because actually it's not, uh, it, it's like, it seems to be something more mysticism, like more of a mysticism, mystical, spiritualist type of thing. And his emphasis is much more on education. So he says that education creates your income. It's a source of income. Education can reform some. Education can be something which empowers some. 
Whereas these mystical things, they don't do that in that way. So his emphasis is much more on Shabbada, the ocean of knowledge, coming as a teacher to teach us and to speak to us. And then um, that's the way in which Baba does that. So uh, listen to the Pope messages as well. They are you know, useful. They can be insightful. They give us something a little fresh, updating. And how, how the system of administration has worked as well. It's been a combination of discussion, decision-making, and confirmation. So in Brahma Baba's days, of course, he was the dominant instrument. But um, if he, he also held himself, um, he, he opened himself to uh, others. In so Brahma Baba's attitude was he shouldn't completely trust his own decision making. So what Brahma Baba would do is he would verify his ideas through these trans messages. So he would ask them to take an idea to Shiv Baba and then come back. But he also wouldn't rely on one of them. So he might give that same point to five. And five of the sisters would come back with messages. And if he got a similar message among but then he would go with that. So one thing that Brahma Baba is teaching us is apart from when Shiv Baba himself comes and speaks, all of us will have a mixture of human beings So as human beings. So that's why we can't fully trust our own intellects. So even Brahma Baba would verify in this way. And then as time went on, when he was empowering everyone in the 60s, because he was preparing everything for after him, um, he began to set up what he called seminars. And these were the first service meetings. So, uh, he didn't used to attend these. So the seniors of that time, they began service planning meetings. So what Baba says is that you've got to, first of all, discuss things with other Brahmins, because that's part of your humility and verification and getting everyone's ideas. Then what the seniors would do, they would then talk with, say, like Daddy Janki or Daddy Prakashi, so whoever is the more senior, appointed person, getting their ideas. Then that appointed person would either ask about Dada when Bhat Dada came, um, in the physical body, or um, Daddy Prakashmani used to ask Daddy Gozar to go into trance quite frequently to verify some ideas with them. So there's a role of trance, but it's in this spirit of us, none of us knowing everything, none of us being able to just rely on my own ideas. Um, but we're verifying constantly with the morally, with each other, with whoever is the senior instrument. And also they used to ask about Dada through trance as well. Maybe they still do. And um, that's how everything is also administered. So I hope that clarifies things for everyone. So I'm going to stop that topic now, but people can get back to me if you have any questions.